Thank you. So welcome to the uh, last panel of the meeting and also uh, the last uh, activity of those four days. Real pleasure to do that. My name is Gilbert Brunet. And uh, this panel title will be Future Power Research in Service Priorities. So let me explain you how I want to proceed. I think we have put the question there. That's great. So um, the panel members, I've seen those questions, uh, I think, on Wednesday. And they will speak for it, each of them, five minutes. And then we'll go in a Q&A question. So I will take a question from the floor. I just want to develop uh, some uh, dynamic between the panel and the floor. If not, I'll ask question myself. And uh, I will just say a few comments about those questions so you have the time to, to uh, think about them. The first one is what do we see as the future demand for polar research and services? We saw just a few minutes ago a diagram with f demand for service in the polar region. Uh, you could take one of them. I can tell you I've seen a big gap there. I didn't see any allusion in all those diagrams. Uh, I would call that uh, ecosystem in managing, ecosystem in monitoring. There was not, nothing about that. This is a future. I have to see 25 years ago when I start thinking about Earth stem prediction, it was a, my big focus. <laughs> and and it's, it's not there. Fine. We'll, we'll have to imagine this is a gap and we need to address. The second question is, what are the existing and emerging capabilities that can help meet this future demand equitably? Um, emerging capability, uh, we've seen things, new type of observation, new, new, new satellite mission uh, as an example, so please feel free to see what you think. Equitably, it means that we need to have in our mind everyone who live in those polar regions, not only uh, for transport, defense, but also the people who live there. So it's important that we think in terms of all people who could use this uh, information. And the third question is, how should the Polar Research and Services Act to meet this future challenge? And how we, we go forward? What is the legacy of PPP in the year of polar prediction? I've heard years of polar prediction. We should continue with the same model. We have a PCAPS also, which is, a, um, I would not say promoted, but suggested by uh, the World Radio Research Program. So how we go in the future? and continue to do this, because I think we all agree there is there's much to do. In fact, we're just starting. Then I will invite uh, first uh, Daniela. Okay, Daniela, please. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. I was looking for the roaming microphone. As you wish, you want to be in the front, I can sit there. Or... Well, I can actually stand. I've yeah, been sitting like so much <laughs> for the last few days. And actually, I discovered tonight that the hotel very kindly put an ideas pad right next to the bed, which I used to jot down a few ideas because I couldn't help but not sleep and think about what I was going to say. So who of you just, out of interest, knows what the future holds and what future demands will look like? Is there anyone in the room here? So we were actually asked a rather impossible question. And let me just start by saying we don't know what we don't know yet. We will only find out about that later on. So there needs to be, with whatever we do, there needs to be room for opportunism and for flexibility to respond to emerging opportunities and needs as they arise and to be ready when they arrive. So we have already heard this last week, and I think I'll just use one microphone at my feedback. Um, we have already heard that we need integrated, accessible, real-time data, also on visibility, for instance, fog, which is currently really, really poor, and wind, as well as wave and sea ice movements. We have already also heard that more choice is not necessarily better. People struggle with choice. Wherever people have to make a choice, an investment is needed. It costs money because it costs time. It costs trial and error. And where we might be able to take that away, 
um, users might be better off. And then I started thinking more about the future demands thing. Um, and if you ask a social scientist about futures, they think they might start thinking about futuring and scenarios, different scenarios. And in my mind, I envisioned a scenario where we've got an x-axis and imagine you've got volume and characteristics of human activities in the polar regions. But it obviously increases going well, your way that way. And on the y-axis you have whatever you want. It could be environmental or ethical concerns matched against it. And then you have those four scenario spaces. And in, the, in your, what is it, top right, you have an increasing number of vessels, not necessarily exploitive activities, but tourism, for instance. And environmental integrity remains important. Research activities increase, and there might be other activities as well. Um, lower down, on lower on the environmental ethical value scale, you might have more exploitative activities in the Arctic and the Antarctic. You might be even thinking about permanent settlements in the Antarctic, which has been raised um, as other areas become submerged in seawater, and we may have to resettle in the future. We may think more about fresh water extraction for drinking water, but also irrigation water. Again, nothing that is new but something that has come up in recent years more. And we might think more creatively about carbon storage in the Southern Ocean, for instance. And then on the other end of the scale, where activities decrease, and that's actually not as far from what we can imagine, um, what we could imagine years ago, as it is what we could, can imagine now with COVID, putting a halt to literally all activities um, in the Antarctic, commercial activities in the Antarctic, for instance. So there could be economic or political pressures to decrease activities in the polar region. There might just not be enough money. Or um, on the environmental step spectrum, you could um, assume a don't care attitude, in which case there would be environmental and human um, health and safety disasters. On the other hand, there could be more deliberate environmental and ethical values placed on lower carbon footprints, in which case activities might also decrease, but deliberately so, due to awareness and so on. And then, of course, we also may want to think about geoengineering solutions. We've heard a lot about extremes of weather and climate, and I think potentially, and I'm just dreaming that up here, there might be a time when corrective intervention in terms of weather and climate is being called for. So then you're not supposed to just predict the weather where, but you might be tasked with thinking, well, what parameters do have to be tweaked with what kind of aerosols or cloud intervention, cloud seeding, or whatever other technologies there are um, to prevent extreme cases of weather events and death in the populated areas. And then other demands that I can see are for chemical and biological dispersion events, diseases, how do they travel? I mean, we've, we've just had this case and had to think about that a bit more. So in terms of existing and emerging capacities, I mean, we really do need to build on what we have achieved. I think I'm going way too so, sorry, the night was long. I had a lot of time to think about things. Um, so we have to build on what we have achieved already. We've got capacity here, sitting here, and all over the world that we built over the last few years and beyond. We've got networks. We've got really good people. So let's not throw that away. We've got this foundation upon which we can build a much more impressive house. And I think it was Neil earlier who spoke about the foundation being important and we can build upon this. We've also got a brand with the PPP and we have to trust in people's brand recognition skills. So in terms of um, vessels of opportunity, I think those were raised quite nicely by Hotter Witten yesterday and the day before. Um, and we might want to use some more um, we also, on the point of equity, I think we tend to think about the North Polar and the South Polar regions 
and we forget sometimes that there's a whole swath in the middle. And I recall, I don't know who put the chart up on Monday that showed observations and weather stations and how they were distributed. And obviously, they were all tailing off in the Arctic and Antarctic especially, but also around the equator in the poorest regions of the world. So how can we ensure that whatever we do has benefits for all of humankind rather than just for the privileged few we have sitting in this room. So, and then, finally, in the future, I think that brings me to lobbying for more equitable funding, but also reminding us that we need this freedom to experiment. And I think, oh, who was it, Machiel, I think, said that earlier. And that's really, really important. We should not over-administer grants and have all these requirements that we spend more time on reporting than we spend on actually doing some work. Um, we should also engage with people, stakeholders, built on what we have with the indigenous communities as well. And we've learned that it takes time to build trust and it takes investment. We might also think about um, opportunities presented by station rebuilds in the Antarctic, which are currently happening. I will be finishing soon, um, which are currently happening at an increasing rate. What kind of equipment and gear could be installed there now if we put it in the plan that might serve us into the future? And then finally, we also, we might want to work with cognitive scientists. We are talking about prediction. The brain is the biggest prediction machine we have. Can we learn, can we use those neural networks and how the brain does things and work with cognitive scientists and others, economists have been mentioned, in the future to broaden what we do much more smartly rather than reinventing the wheel. And then finally, also work with futuring scientists to actually understand what is ahead of us and prepare for it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Daniela. I would like now to invite uh, Jorn Christiansen. Jorn, please. Thank you. No. I didn't stay up all night, but my handwriting is rather b um, bad, so I had to use the computer. In high school, I, my, my grade, uh, teacher graded me in circa because he couldn't read, but it was probably very good what I've written. <laughs> okay, to the topic, sorry. <laughs> Number <of> good. <laughs> I, I, I try not to repeat what's been said and, and try to keep on time, so it's, uh, I have the time there. Perhaps you haven't, uh, okay, so I had one slide earlier today, um, I tried to emphasize, um, and that's also uh, known to all of us, but the, the importance of uh, confidence in the weather forecast. So uh, ensemble prediction system design, that's not getting easier with high resolution, it's not getting easier with our system model because all these components interact, uh, introducing more small-scale small scale structures. It's also not so easy because it's computational demanding. Running experiments for ensemble prediction systems require a lot of computing power. And it's also perhaps not so attractive because you can always go to higher resolution with a deterministic model and the features look nicer. So it's about finding the balance there and also having verification metrics that can guide us um, in that sense. Um, perhaps this uh, ME, uh, MIPS uh, model in, uh, into comparison and uh, improvement uh, projects uh, can help us in this. Peter Bauer had a very good point about the digital twin. I also learned that the digital twin is uh, one step further from our system model, like a shadow. So that could also be something we should uh, consider for um, future research. A couple of models have been mentioned, so I think I'll skip that beyond mentioning that we should focus both on the northern and southern uh, polar regions. Um, with what I've said, I think it's quite important to accelerate the use of new technologies. You all know this plateau in, in terms of computing, you know, CPUs and so on, so we need to move on to new technologies for computing, but it also new technologies can help, help us for data throughput new ways of disseminating data, streaming data, for instance. Um, 
then had a few comments on services. This obviously, center the needs of user, um, users of information to drive the science. Um, let's see. Visualization, um, both for uh, communication with the forecast, uh, outreach, uh, education. I don't want one, okay, one thing. I don't want us going home here and sort of saying windy is something bad. Wind is, I mean, okay, it's not from Met service, so that might not be so good, but users actually using our data. Windy, is, I'm looking at you, Johnny. Is no left data is probably the, the main source uh, somewhere. Um, GFS is there and so on, Canadian model. I mean, the visualization is good. It is using on short lines. It's our data, guys. So it, it's really good. And it's also challenging us to, to pr improve our services. So we, we should embrace uh, Windy and other types of initiatives. Um, yeah, I'm trying to just see. Yeah, okay. Coupled modeling is also a way to understand and better predict uh, hazards and then perhaps cope on the events and then under climate change. Um, one thing I think is challenging is, is what is normal anymore. And then especially in the Arctic and the perhaps also Antarctic, the climate change is so rapid that the normal is changing perhaps faster than climate change. And norm, uh, normal is the way we have established our um, societies, for instance. And there's been a number of good um, presentations and uh, results on this uh, during this week. Um, yep. I, I was talking about open and then user-oriented data, but also thinking, uh, continuing this and using uh, software as a bridging tool towards more tailored or specific uh, services for the users, but also engaging with the private industry. I have two minutes, so I'll move on to um, future challenges. Um, as others said, we should embrace what we have achieved with the PPP and YOP. Um, this enabling culture, we don't think about it, but we feel it. That the, the, all this community has been sort of an enabling culture to work together. I don't see much sort of uh, friction between model center, between social scientists, verification. I feel this is a really rather well-functioning community. It's a slight competition. We want to be better than Johnny and guys in, with our model, but still we benefit largely from the collaboration. And we see that we in this board together and serving society and uh, making them mitigation actions with climate change. So we should also build on the upside with activities, for instance. Um, and we can be even more inclusive. Um, the World Weather Research, Progr World Weather Research Progr Program can facilitate coordination of operational centers, for instance, as I said, and the multimodal ensembles, for instance. Uh, branding was mentioned, and then I would just like to end to quote the match trip, have fun. Thank you. Thank you, Jorn. I'd like to invite now David Bowich. David. Okay, I'm not sure I have a whole lot to contribute here, but um, I was trying to think about what the polar regions might look like in the future. Um, and we know that climate change is particularly accelerated in the Arctic, and it is also true in the Antarctic, but it's much more regional. So what does that mean? I th well, I think it means that it's going to be more activity, perhaps a whole lot more activity. People with a wider range of goals and needs, uh, and therefore needs for services. You can think about <clears throat> commercial activities like ships going along the um, through the Arctic to cut down the transit time between the uh, Pacific and Atlantic. Um, there's almost certainly in the Arctic going to be uh, mining up there, so how to get the, uh, the minerals and there's probably a lot of natural gas and stuff like that out of it. And I think we're almost certainly going to see much more activity, at least in the north, from different militaries. 
And uh, so we need to think there's probably going to be a much wider range of... It's going to look more like the mid-latitudes in some senses. That, you know, we have this idea that the polar regions are distinct from the mid-latitudes. Well, in times in the geologic past, they had crocodiles in Greenland, for example, northern Greenland. Um, probably won't get to that extreme, but, you know, they may be much more like the rest of our planet. The, the climate system put the Antarctic ice sheet there. It can easily take it away. It may not be as uh, rapid as we might think. Anyway, just some thoughts. Uh, I think that, you know, things might look how fast that's going to happen. Uh, that's a good question. Um, but I think don't think we should stay with the status quo. We should think maybe a little bit, you know, there's going to be more of a demand, I think, for the kinds of services that, you know, are there in the more populated parts of our world. All right. Uh, what can we do? Well, um, with the efforts going on with, with the models and uh, how to take the model output and use them, certainly things like high resolution, uh, there's many applications where you want, you want to know the surface winds, okay? That was a big variable. So anytime you've got complex terrain, you need high resolution to go into. You can't use a global model. Um, the, uh, the data assimilation, how to do it effectively in, in, you know, environments where you have sharp spatial gradients, both horizontally and vertically. Um, the one thing, and of course coupled, got to go to coupled processes. Uh, the new observations. Um, well, one thing that, you know, we don't talk about very much, but, uh, you know, one of the basic uh, observational systems we have, you know, in, uh, t particularly in the polar regions but elsewhere, is radiosun balloons. Well, ideally, you wouldn't want to be discarding these things, you know? You throw them up and most of them are lost. Uh, so we need to think about new technologies actually to get around this like surface-based remote sensing, for example, or um, are the new satellite systems capable of replacing all of those? Um, some people believe that the GPS radio occultation satellites will do it all. You know? And you can get down with the GPS RO, they're, they're sort of tangent paths through the atmosphere. You can get up down much lower in the polar atmosphere than you can in the tropics because there's not much moisture there. Um, so there's all sorts of constellations going up of these GPS uh, tracking satellites and uh, so that might be so some kind of combination of surface-based remote sensing and you know advanced satellite systems maybe. Um, okay, question about how to meet these challenges? Well, uh, it's important to interact much more with the users and try to, you know, judge how things are evolving and going to evolve in the future. One should always expect the unexpected. Uh, we've got some experiences from the Antarctic. Uh, the forecasts in the Antarctic are a lot better than they used to be. They're not perfect, but they do encourage people to try things that you perhaps they wouldn't have tried previously. Um, you know, people want to go and climb mountains, the highest mountain in Antarctica. Uh, they want to, you know, so in other words, somebody's got to go and get them. So search and rescue can be a big deal. So interact much more with the users, I think. Okay, so that's everything I have to say. Thank you. Thank you, David. I'd like to invite now Gunia Svensson. Thank you. So, 
I come from a university. I'm a university professor. I am curiosity driven. I want to understand how nature works. But I don't mind if it's useful what I find out. And I think this is, a, this is working then with forecast models, working with processes that we need to parameterize and improving them. And the hypothesis is if we understand them and can describe them better, we will automatically get better forecasts. So that's what's sort of driving myself and I think a lot in, in, in my neighborhood. So. But what I've learned this week and what we've been thinking about having all these activities that we know what the end users want, maybe we should look at a little bit different parameters along the way when we try to improve everything. So I've heard the, the fog, winds, blizzards, winter rain, and these kind of things. And I think we have an opportunity in the existing data sets to look for these cases and see what does the forecast models do. There is a lot of focus on thermodynamic processes, and I think we need to look more in the momentum, and the wind speeds have been really uh, talked a lot about, and as Dave just said, you need high resolution to resolve all things in coastal regions and in, in complex terrain, but they are still interacting with the pro parameterized processes, so we still need to know what's going on there. And as I also said earlier, there is common issues here with the climate community, and I think there is an opportunity to really broaden uh, that sense there. Um, I come from a university, so I also educate, and I think it's really important that we educate the new generation. We've done, I think, a good job during the years here. We should keep doing it. And I also think we need to think about is our university educations, are they really adapted for the future? This, the work that needs to be done at the Met Services and in forecasts, are there other different skills that are needed than actually having all the math and all the meteorology and so on? Are there other skills that are needed and can we combine them in a better way at the universities to better serve the future? So I think that's an interesting and a really good thing to, to think about. Um, there is also the other education then uh, of how forecasts are used by users and how to do that. And I'm really curious about well, wind has come up a lot of times and it's used. It's visualization, what is it? It's, it's our forecast as, as just was mentioned, but it's something in the visualization, it's something there. And we should learn from that and, and pick up on that to really make it better and make it better accessible so we can build on that because we can't run who everyone is doing. I mean, they pick up what they want. And the education as well, what it, what it means, and what it means with an uncertainty as well, I think is an, a probabilistic uh, forecasts. So there's an educational part in that as well. Uh, we talked a lot about this week about the great data sets we have. We have lots of data, data works. We have built networks. We have been built communities that like to work with each other. And a lot of this work that we're doing here is voluntarily. So we need to really enthusiast people to, to work together because that's how we get things done here. So we can align resources and, and, and people and make that happen. And I think the exchange that we saw uh, from uh, METNO, that they have a collaboration with PhD students working on their models with the universities, I think that's a really good model. And we actually talked about that, at the, maybe not the first, but the second uh, the steering group meeting, we talked about how to do it best and can we, f can we find more funding, funding systems for doing that in a more efficient way. I think that's a really great way of working together between the university researchers and the actual getting it into the models too for the future. We also had a presentation on uh, the digital twins and Destination Earth and, and who else than this community can look at what's that, what, what that will bring for the polar regions. What data sets will they have in the data lake? How good are they? What, what's happening there in their really high resolution? Is, are they treating, because there could be lots of people doing lots of like, experiments and or testing what happens in the, in the polar regions without really knowing what's going on there. So I think that's something that maybe it's, it's a responsibility of our community to get involved and see what happens there. Um, so I think that's a sort of, but I want to end here as well, is I think that 
it's really important that we build the communities. We like to work together. We are small enough communities so we can have every, every sort of different sector in the same room and having a dialogue and, and meeting each other and, and bridging by having the human connection, which is so important in the work we do. Thank you. Thank you, Gunia. Uh, I'd like to invite uh, Lorenzo Sampieri. Yeah, so it, it has been said a lot, and yeah, I will try to be brief and to focus on what I know, which is, I think, CI's modeling. And of course, but I think what I will say, you can take it and apply probably also in the ocean, in the atmosphere, in your own research. So in general, we have two strong components in Yacht. We have uh, the observations and we have the models, right? And historically, I mean, even though we, we say we don't understand, like observationalists don't understand models and models don't understand observationally, they shape each other a lot. And I think it's really time to um, bring them together and to do proper data simulation in a couple sense and also to use um, proper observational operators for, for doing this. And I think this is an important point. This will um, also help to create better analysis that then we can use for um, making maybe better predictions. But I think having good analysis themselves for polar regions have a lot of value. And, also going a bit beyond the concept of CI's concentration and thickness and maybe adding other variables, maybe the light transmittance in CI's could also help a lot of uh, biologists and uh, yeah, who knows what, but uh, yeah, we need to, to do this. Also, uh, I think we have a very good awareness of how good our products are and when we give them, also when we give them to the scientific community, I think, yeah, we are not always able to communicate well the limitations and to be clear. And I think this is an important step. So really to be open and to try to um, convey what we provide can really do. I think there is also an issue of, when it comes to observations, there is first of all an issue of being ready to the next satellites. So I think, for example, when it comes to CIs, we always um, run in terms of data simulation after the observation. So when a new satellite is available, then we are a bit taken by surprise, and then it takes years in order to develop a good scheme to assimilate that. I think it should be the other way around. We should really be involved, like I, that's my ideal view, but we should really involved in a process of um, development of those missions. and being ready when they arrive to use them immediately. And I think this also helps uh, people that are providing observations. And I think there is um, another very good thing in Yop that I really experienced uh, as an early career scientist, and which I think has been given for granted in this meeting, which is the, this duality between operation and research. And I think Yop is a very good highway between the, the two. So for me, it was very nice to interact with, uh, directly with operational centers. And I think it gave me a deep understanding of this, um, these interactions uh, and of how an operational center works. And this shapes my, my research and I can have uh, much more impact if I understand what's the, uh, the final goal. And, and I think this is very unique I, when I talk with uh, people from other fields, for example, oceanography, meteorology, in, they do a very cool study about predictability, but yeah, this, this your peculiarity of really seeing the final product and developing together, I think it's something that yeah, we should uh, keep having. And finally, yeah, I think it's very clear that um, we have a lot of different expertise here, right? So there is this um, very good chain that goes from uh, processes to the, the final user. And I think it's very important that we are all aware 
of how the chain looks like, but that we also maintain all the, the pieces so that we really have a component that arrives to users, so the, the social scientist part, the communication, the coordination. <laughs> And yeah, because I mean, uh, yeah, sometimes there is the risk of asking the, the scientist to really reach uh, the, the end of the chain, and that's a very big thing to do. And yeah, so personally, I, I don't feel good enough for doing that, but it's very nice to see that there are people that can really help you to bring your science to the, to the end. So yeah, that's it. I certainly agree with the last point. Uh, the chain value is very important to understand that, and that's part of the challenge. We need to start work, working on this more and more, and I think the YAP uh, meeting it was a good uh, example of that. Diane? Thank you. So I'm going to start off by saying thank you to all of you. Uh, this week has been uh, incredible. And I think one of my first messages uh, uh, for, for this last panel is to say, that collaboration to this extent built over such a period of time, we have to make sure that we not only maintain it, but as was mentioned in previous discussions, find the succession strategy for it. And there's a few important reasons I would say for that. The first is that, you know, I've, I've been struck by other speakers, but I also personally believe that we're at a period now in history of geopolitical change, and that's going to affect how we are going to be able to collaborate in the future. So I think it's really up to people like myself and others who head MET services, who engage in WMO and other international mechanisms to support you and to make sure that you get the, uh, you get the capacity and the ability to be able to continue to collaborate through this period. So in other words, um, you know, this is a valuable thing that we don't want to take for granted because it's taken time and uh, all of your efforts to build. The second thing is, uh, um, I want to pick up on a point that uh, Tanel gave. I, I do feel that we are also in this very, um, very, uh, a sense, disturbing period where we see the rate of change happening very quickly. And I think there is merit to thinking about how to bring in concepts of looking at the extremes now because I believe that we are at a tipping point and it will take, it'll overtake us probably more quickly than, uh, than we expect. So I think in the next phase, we should be focusing on what are those elements that we can advance with a sense of urgency so that we actually can provide more information, predictive information and services that are linked to the, the rate and pace of extreme events. And I think in Canada, this has really, really come home in the last couple of years. So when I think about Arctic or polar, you know, and Arctic in the Canadian context, I really draw a line a bit further south probably than all of you are, which includes northern communities that are vulnerable and the, uh, where the rate of change there is very, uh, very important. And that means really looking also at hydrology. It means that looking at the change of the landscape. So very much agree with, uh, with Gilbert on that. And I think it would be worth bringing in. Um, the other thing I wanted to say, really, because so much has already been said, was in the next phases, uh, I think it will be important to really take a good look at the existing capabilities there are. So since the project was launched, all of the MET services that actually provide services in these regions have also evolved, as has WMO. So through the governance reform with the new commissions, we now have new mechanisms to integrate. And therefore, I think a, a bit of a taking stock, as well as the priorities and the legacy, let's have a look at actually what's being put in place in terms of these new mechanisms so that we don't duplicate. We actually link with these mechanisms. So if I put that in a very pointed way in terms of services, you know, uh, whether it was, um, uh, Met Norway or DMI or the Canadian Meteorological Service, we all have service development staff. We all have, uh, in fact, important service relationships with the military, the Coast Guard, uh, marine users. Some of it's based on revenue, some of it's based on key priorities. But there's expertise in that service development community that I think would be a good idea to link 
into the next phases. So from a social science research perspective and then the service development uh, perspective, we actually are aligning our work uh, more closely because you know user needs surveys, they're great, we use them. Um, we want to go, I think, a bit beyond that. I think the behavioral insights part of the research, that to me is critical. And I, I think that part, I would like to see it informed by the disruptive forces that are taking place. So the comment that was made about climate change, climate change is an extremely disruptive force when it comes to behavioral uh, uh, matters. And understanding what that does in how people understand information, how they fear the future, and how they'll respond to the information that we give them, to me, is the type of research I think is important to actually launch now. Um, so one last uh, comment, and that has to do, again, with connection points between, uh, between organizations. You know, thinking about the Antarctica, one of the interesting challenges that's been, that's been there is it's a place of great collaboration, but it's also a place where, from a, a governance perspective, one of the biggest challenges being you don't have a single entity who is responsible for providing services or, you know, so it makes it complex. So when you're a tour operator, when you're a user in there, that does make it complex. So uh, through WMO, uh, looking at new mechanisms that might change the way that we operationally operate um, in some of these regions is also part of what I think we need to work towards. And again, I think we can help connect that service dimension, that operational service dimension, within the research that can support it. Um, and EC4s, uh, you know, has taken a role in the past to ensure we, we built and, and launched the Arctic RCC. We're looking at how we do that for the Antarctic. Those really are mechanisms to try to get an operational collaboration between countries. And I think we're going to need to do more of that in the future and share the responsibility of doing the issuance of uh, products. So I'll stop there since uh, so much has been said before, but thank you. Okay, good. That was great, thank you very much. Um, you have the time to read the question yourself, so I'm sure you've been inspired. Anyone who would like to make comment on this? Ah, okay. It works. Uh, I just want to thank the panel for super useful insights. And um, uh, one uh, comment that I want to follow up on, uh, just based on also what uh, Dan Campbell said, is that yeah, we need new concepts to think about user needs and services and move, move beyond that. And um, you mentioned vulnerability, but another one that is actually not completely new, not new at all, but uh, has been maybe a little bit missing in the discussion this week is impacts. Mm -hmm. And impact-based forecasting, of course, is uh, highly on the agenda of WMO. So I was wondering what the panel is thinking about um, uh, impact-based forecasting and thinking uh, through impacts on society um, to steer the services and the research that, uh, that we can do in the future. Good point. Anyone would like to try this one? Okay, Diane. Uh, so thank, thank you for that, that uh, point because uh, you're right on. If you look across, uh, not only WMO, so WMO is actually its members. So it's all of the Met Service, all the countries that participate. And most of us are rallied right now uh, around the concept of impact-based forecasting early notification, and actually, if you look at the, our, our new call to action, you know, for early warning services that will protect every citizen across the globe, which is hugely ambitious uh, call to action, that really is shaping the way we're doing things. And in Canada, impact-based forecasting means that not only are you thinking about a timely and accurate forecast, but you're actually informing about events as they unfold. So, you know, the continuum there of service is from an outlook type of time horizon right down into the immediate um, event. So you're preparing people, communities, or public authorities from a preparedness side all the way, which means our services will transcend what, you know, we segment 
as a climate thing versus a, you know, seasonal slash weather thing into an immediate now cast. And that's the vision. And as I said, uh, this is really a very common vision across WMO members. Thank you. Anyone on the panel would like to add on this? Um, yes, really good point, and you also mentioned Diane that um, we should collaborate on this. I mean, if you send out one message and uh, we have another way of communicating impact-based warnings, it's not helping a lot. So I think that's an uh, area we could uh, strengthen the collaboration, as you said in your speech just now. I don't know if Daniel would uh, add. Yes. And again, I would take a broader lens and try to think about impacts much more broadly than just impacts on society, but impacts on the socio-ecological system, which includes humans and the environment and other animals. And we cannot decouple those because we are a part of them. Um, and we might want to think about not just the impacts that extreme weather events and climate change, which we are all aware of, have on this coupled socio-ecological system, but also how our investments into forecasting can help prevent certain environmental disasters, for instance. So what kind of costs, maybe thinking also in terms of ecosystem services, can be preserved through more investment in forecasting capacity? So I would add that dimension to the cultural and very important societal one, because we try to see ourselves as a part from the environment when this is just not feasible. Mm. No, very good point. Um, like I said at the beginning, uh, 25 years ago, I was pushing earth system prediction. I'm really happy to see what's happening here this week. There's other place we can see the same thing. And um, I think it's missing here in the room, this uh, ecosystem, managing ecosystem, uh, uh, monitoring the, the ecosystem, and maybe they can take action. This is, uh, I'm working now in Australia. I'm presently talking with the Australian Arctic Division. They really want this digital twin. It's a little bit something you're not familiar with, but they really want to have this modeling capacity to monitor uh, the ecosystem. So that's something we should, uh, put more around here uh, next time. Uh, I think you could leverage a lot also of a great proposal and then funding from those uh, uh, science uh, organization who are looking into this. I know it's been a long week and I'm not sure anyone would like to intervene on less, less last question. And then I could, ah, okay, good David. One of uh, the early expectations, w specifically on year of uh, your polar prediction, was a recognition that there was insufficient um, coverage uh, observations in in the polar regions. This has been talked about for a long time. Um, I'd have to say one of my expectations when I was uh, chairing EC4s when we were in uh, Hobart um, was would there be information that comes out of this proposal that could inform um, governments about what would be are the gaps, the data gaps. And I actually think there's an opportunity to um, uh, we had a process where we had all of these targeted um, uh, activities, focused, focused targeted um, uh, periods, because we needed more observations, because we needed to have uh, more um, data and information. And it's great that we're kind of focusing, so what is this PPP2 or whatever it'll be called going forward. But I actually think there's an opportunity to talk about the benefit of having this kind of increased data 
Because once the data disappears and you don't have it, you're kind of going back to not having it anymore. And there'd be no stimulation, say, by governments to say, well, we should step up our game. Uh, maybe there's a targeted strategy like we experienced, but somehow I think something that comes out of the vote, particularly question number two, about existing emerging capabilities that can help meet these future demands also relate to what would be the message that you want to share with governments on the observation strategy in polar regions. And, uh, you know, there wasn't a whole lot of talk. It was talked about all the benefits of using the data, but reality is when the project's done, it's done, and governments go back to complaining they don't have enough budget to do this and that, and, you know, they have to prioritize, et cetera. So that's the real world for, for med agencies. They've got to deal with the budget they have. But a strong message that comes out to say that that needs to be increased actually can help national med services leverage their own governments to get the funding to support such initiatives. So to me, this is a missed opportunity. And the second aspect that struck me from just watching, you only had a couple of presentations that talked about the benefits of the sort of the improvements in our ability to predict change in the polar regions on mid-latitudes. And that was mostly just cold wave outbreak in the, in the north, and there were a couple of, ex, a couple of three actually presentations on that. Um, I have to say I also had that expectation um, in 2011 when, uh, what was 2010, when we went to uh, prepare the WMO to adopt PPP, um, that there would be real benefits. So when I see a particular gap, shouldn't we put, uh, encourage uh, research organizations, reanalysis, other activities that are working in the tropics and the in the mid-latitudes to look at it, actually how did forecasts improve in those regions because we improved our understanding of what's going on in polar regions. I think that that would be a missed opportunity for, for this group not to share that. So those are two things that I believe should be on the agenda for messaging that you're gonna to have to take back to WMO and the World Weather Research Program for part two. Great, thank you for this. Okay, anyone else would like to share with us uh, their views on this? Ah, okay, please. Ah, sorry. I had a comment on this. Oh, okay, just one minute. Okay, so I, I just wanted to comment on these observations and I think that um, maybe there are some missed uh, studies that could have been done and uh, that can be done. And I think something that came out is that it's under certain conditions that we really need the extra, like radio soundings or so on, that, that can really advance. the. And maybe we need to be smarter on when and where to do these observations. And I also like to uh, think about this, this way of maybe using that there is more activities in the polar regions and design. Um, I know that there are projects in trying to design like containers that automatically do a lot of observations and that can be used and they will travel through these uh, waters and can give a lot of more information that can be used and we can see the value of them. So I just wanted to pitch in those two things. Great. Good. Good. And uh, anyone else on the panel would like? Okay, great, please. Yeah, I have a comment concerning the emerging capabilities. Uh, maybe I'm not aware of this, but um, you know, there are atmospheric uh, models of uh, global which are of low resolution and countries are making re uh, zonal, regional models like uh, in Canada here, Uranus. Um, I'm wondering if there is such a region, regional model for the Arctic and you know you have to initiate this model from on the border, and uh, this is specifically where in the, in the Arctic there are data on the border to to initiate uh, such a regional model to have high resolution for for the Arctic and be able to make a better prediction and forecast. Well, David, you like to see something on this or no? 
regional numerical prediction. I think uh, we have. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so my group has done a lot of regional modeling for the Arctic. Um, and it is true that it's important to put your boundaries in the right place. And an important perspective is that around about 70 north has the greatest coverage of radiosonde observations on planet Earth. So, you know, I, everybody says the Arctic is data sparse. Well, that's a relative statement. If you talk about it relative to the Antarctic, I mean, you're awash in observations. And we do have these polar orbiting satellites. We've got more polar orbiting satellites than we know what to do with. And one of the big solutions here is to figure out how to make effective use of all of that stuff. So. Well, that's a good point. Uh, correct, if someone can correct me if I'm wrong, but there's been some forecast sensitivity to observation studies recently, global one, and um, the original sound, I mean, all of Australia and Antarctica come to the top. <laughs> I mean, they are really important, especially for, for what you just said. I mean, the northern hemisphere is a wash of observation, but the southern hemisphere need really more. Okay, um, anyone else would like to? Uh... Okay, well, I'll go in that direction. I was started a few minutes ago. It's been a long week. And uh, what I'll do now is give some time back to Barbara, so, well, almost. <laughs> and uh, it was a pleasure to chair the last uh, activity, last, last panel. Thank you very much for the panel. Nice.